indications for drainage of CSF in our operating rooms usually come uh, in one of two areas. There is drainage during neurosurgical cases to, faci to facilitate exposure and drainage during aortic surgery either by cardiac or by vascular surgeons in order to improve perfusion of the spinal cord. So uh, most practitioners assume that the guidelines published by the American Society of Regional Anesthesia for anticoagulation in neuraxial anesthetics would hold for lumbar drain placement as well. Catheter drains are placed in the operating room under sterile conditions immediately before the procedure. Placement occurs while you're wearing a hat, a mask, a sterile gown, and sterile gloves. To place a lumbar drain in the operating room, you need four major items from the stock room. You need the drainage system, and we use this system made by Codman here. It's clear on the other side, it looks like this. You need the tray that contains the actual drainage catheter, and we use this version from Medtronic here. It's just in this featureless box. Usually the catheter and the drainage system are stocked right next to each other in the stock room. These items don't contain things like a sterile drape or lidocaine, so we usually open a standard epidural tray just to give us these additional items. And finally, you need a single transducer that is not marked with red arterial markings. It would obviously be ambiguous to have arterial markings for some other uh, indication. So we have this single unmarked transducer. So you can set up the, uh, the drainage reservoir either before or after you place the drain, just depending on urgency. The drainage system needs to be primed with sterile saline uh, before it's connected to a patient in order to uh, have CSF drain properly. So we start by taking a, our single transducer and we disconnect all of the tubing from it. All that we need is the transducer itself and its electrical connection. We connect that transducer to the three-way stopcock on the drainage system. And then to the back end where a pressure bag would otherwise go, we connect a 10cc syringe full of sterile saline. So to prime in an upward direction, I rotate the stopcock downward, pull the plunger, and then squirt until normal saline has filled that system. Then I rotate the stopcock upward to prime in a downward direction. Again, pull the plunger, squirt some normal saline until the green tubing is filled. At that point, I disconnect the syringe and then replace it with just a red cap. And this is now a closed loop for transduction. Once sterile, with the patient sitting up in the same uh, position as for an epidural catheter, we would usually set up our field, including the epidural tray to provide a sterile field. So then we'd open the catheter itself. There's an inner sterile peel pack, which contains two items. And then there's a separate peel pack with a long, thin stylet wire for the catheter. The catheter itself is very thin and flexible, much more so than an epidural catheter. It can be inserted into the patient either unstyletted or styletted. I prefer to stylet it myself, but either technique is acceptable. The catheter has a blunt tip to it. You can see there's a black pigmented closed end tip and then several holes in the uh, distal one or two centimeters. If you're going to place a stylet, it's hard to thread the stylet through the catheter the whole way, but obviously the stylet needs to come all the way up to the tip. So the catheter needs to be laid out straight, and then usually it's helpful to moisten the stylet a little bit so that we can make use of our saline in the epidural tray. You simply thread and keep threading. Okay, at this point, the end of the stylet 
is touching the inside of the uh, it's touching the inside of the catheter, and the catheter is ready to go. It's long and it's awkward when it's dilated, which is why it's really helpful to have an assistant. The needle itself resembles an epidural needle. It has an inner trocar and it has a notch that aligns to tell you that the trocar is placed properly. So the skin is infiltrated with lidocaine in the usual fashion. And with a sterile drape, or with sterile prepping and sterile draping in place, uh, you work on accessing CSF with the needle. Almost always uh, the L45 inner space is used. This is not like neuraxial anesthesia where you want to match the height of the surgery to the level at which you access the epidural space. Uh, and it would very rarely be appropriate to place a needle like this at a level where there was actually spinal cord. So typically we use L45, perhaps one level up would be appropriate, but probably not more than that. So the needle is simply advanced blindly until it appears to be in the space, and then the stylet is withdrawn, and if you're properly in the subarachnoid space, simply have your assistant hand you the end of the catheter and begin to thread. Flow of CSF through a needle this big is going to be really brisk. It, it's not subtle. And then when the catheter is sufficiently far threaded, you remove the needle from the patient using the same push-pull motion you'd use for an epidural, leaving the styleted catheter in place. So with the styleted catheter in place, the next, the next requirement is to remove the stylet. Uh, because this catheter is so thin and rubbery, you run the risk of collapsing the catheter as you remove the stylet. This is best prevented by pinching the catheter fairly firmly right as it emerges from the patient's back, and then with the catheter straight, using your other hand, removing the stylet. And you'll be able to feel with uh, the hand that's close to the patient when the tip of the stylet is out of the patient's. And then the danger is passed, and you simply remove the stylet the entire way, and then pull your catheter back to your desired distance. Most people leave this catheter further inside the CSF than is typical with an epidural catheter. Most people will use somewhere between five and eight centimeters inside the CSF. It's useful to look at the markings because they're very unintuitive. You'll see there's a single dot, a double dot, and a triple dot. The single dot is at 10 centimeters from the tip of the catheter, the double is at 15, and the triple is at 20. So that's not equivalent to the way an epidural catheter is marked. You can see that with the needle lying beside the catheter, when the single dot is at the hub, the tip of the catheter is at the tip of the needle. To connect the back end of the catheter to the system requires this little clear boot and this white plastic lure connector. So first, the boot is threaded onto the catheter. Then the lure connection is made. And the boot is slid back until it clicks. And there's a fairly definite feeling that it's properly seated. It's also possible to tie a suture around this uh, groove that goes through that boot to further secure it. And then this can be uh, tested for aspiration of CSF, which should occur quite readily. And then it can be placed off the field and connected to the pre-primed green tubing like this. And at that point, the system can be opened and CSF drainage will start.